Thanks for downloading Pave the Way Podcast. On this show, your host, Greg Helbeck, interviews the top minds in real estate, business, and personal development to help you crack the code so you can grow your business and, more importantly, grow your life. Get ready for another game-changing episode. If you want to learn how to master your day and become a productivity monster, download Greg's free guide on daily personal productivity for free at www.pavetheday.com. That's pave the day spelled D A Y dot com. Now it's time for today's episode. Enjoy. All right, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Pave the Way Podcast. I'm here with Adrian Dorison from RunLikeClockwork.com. And we're going to talk today about how to systematize your real estate investing business. And uh, a lot of the stuff, pretty much all the stuff we're going to talk about is, is coming from a very popular book that I've read many times called Clockwork. And uh, Mike and Adrian run a company and they, they basically teach people how to implement a lot of the systems from that book. So I'm really excited to get you on the show. Thank you so much for joining us. And I'm looking forward to a great interview. Yeah. Thanks for having me. I love that you've read it many times too. That makes me feel good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I always learn something new when I read yes. it at a different time, you know? Yes. I do the same thing with books that like, I feel I really need to implement. I'm like, all right, I'm going to read this again and again and again. <laughs> so exactly. I and mean, you put it on audible. Resume. Yeah. You put it on audible and then it's like, you can just recite the book. Yeah. Right? You, you hear something <laughs> new. Well, you're in for a treat because actually we're doing a revised version of the book, which has a ton of changes, just updates, new stories, better ways to explain things. And so it's going to be coming out next summer, I believe. So in 2022, you'll get a newer version of clockwork 2.0 i love it i'm looking yeah. forward to that i'm all, yeah. i'll pre-order that already <laughs> <laughs> it's not up yet but we'll let you know when it is <laughs> right on well that's awesome i'm looking forward to that so if people aren't familiar with you how you know just give us a little bit about your background how you got in the business and then we'll talk about the concepts in the book yeah so my background is actually from the corporate manufacturing world i have certifications, specializations in the Lean Six Sigma toolkit, which is essentially how do we create more efficiency inside of organizations. And so I used to do that at the corporate level, working on operational efficiency. And then I left my corporate job to start my own consulting practice. And I started to try to figure out how to apply some of those same concepts and tools that were built for big businesses. Like how do we apply them to small businesses, because when you work in the corporate world, you understand that uh, resources are much more abundant than they are for a small business owner. And so something that, you know, might not be a big deal to a big business would be a really important cost savings or, you know, cost reduction to a small business owner. So I became much more interested in how to apply some of those principles to small businesses. I started my own consulting practice. And then a few years into that, I met Mike McCallowitz through an introduction. He was already in the process of writing the clockwork book. He knew he wanted to bring like operational efficiency to small business owners. And so someone, a mutual friend introduced him to me because they were like, you have to meet Adrian if you're wanting to write this book. And so we he interviewed me many times for the book to talk through, you know, some of the intellectual property and frameworks and tools that you now see in the book. And then we decided, well, he decided that he wanted to ask me to run the actual organization. And so that's how Run Like Clockwork kind of came to be, is that Mike is primarily the author. I am primarily the uh, creator of a lot of those frameworks and tools. And I run the company that now delivers that program to customers who want to take it, you know, who want to take the book to the next level and really fully implement the process. That's awesome. Yeah, no. And a lot of the, um, a lot of the stuff in the book is very easy to remember that you, you helped him design. Like I'll give you an example. There's a really popular book called the E-Myth. I'm sure you've heard of it. Yes. And that, that's a really good book. Classic. I, yeah, it was classic, but it was a little kind of a little more high level. I think it's like whole like work on your business, not in your business. But I remember reading the E Myth first, and then reading Clockwork. I'm like, this is just a way better version of the E Myth that's easier mm -hmm. to remember and actually implement. And that's yes. where Clockwork, the whole ideology, really 
stood out to me. I'm like, oh, this is like a really interesting version of the E-Myth. And I actually can take this yes. and start executing right away, you know, with my systems. Yeah. And that's our goal is to, it was to create the simplest system to create ultra efficiency for small business owners. Because as I was, you know, doing my own research development, learnings, building my own expertise, I realized that a lot of the tools and systems that were out there were very complex. And like the, the one thing that a small business owner cannot handle is like more complexity, right? It's another friction and barrier point to implementation. And so our main focus was like, how do we make this as simple as possible while getting people, getting them to the point of operational efficiency and getting the results out of their systems that they really need. And if something is complex, it's just going to put up a, a barrier. So we wanted to avoid that for sure. So I'm glad you yeah, noticed. <laughs> absolutely. Like they say, complexity is the enemy of execution. Like you yes. can't execute something that's like with my team. I'm always like, listen, what's the next step? What do we got to do? How do we move this forward? Forget about step five. Yes. Step two is we got to own the property first before we get a tenant inside. You yeah. Know? Let's not worry so, about a problem that doesn't yeah. exist yet. <laughs> yes. it, exactly. Exactly. Yes. So first main question is going to be a softball for you. So if people oh, aren't familiar with clockwork, what does clockworking your business mean? Yeah. So clockworking your business, and we love turning it into a verb for you. Yes. So, you know, clockworking your business is getting the business to a point where it can run and grow without you being involved in the day-to-day -day operation. So essentially, how can we get the systems and the team to a point where they don't need you as the linchpin, they're not dependent on you in order to you know, do all of the functions that a business would need. So make sales, onboard new clients, deliver your product or service to those clients, pay your bills and invoices, like everything that needs to happen for the company to continue to run? Can we get it? Can we clockwork it to a point where you can fully be removed? And so we see this idea, we talk about this idea in the book of the business owner being able to take a fully unplugged four week vacation, because during that four weeks, typically everything in the business will happen. And so we want to make sure that all of those functions can happen without you being there. And so that's really all of our work inside of our book and inside of our program is getting you to the point where you're prepared to step out fully unplugged. And I mean, like no phone calls, no emails, no checking in with the team, no talking to clients during those four weeks, which will just create ultimate independence for you and for the business. I always say that it's like the entrepreneur's insurance policy, right? Because even if we're not planning for a vacation necessarily, there are other reasons that you might want to prepare uh, for anything that might pull you out of the day-to-day -day of the business and make sure that you can keep getting paid and that your team can keep getting paid and that your clients can keep getting served. That's awesome. And it's so true because a lot of uh, people, they, they start their own business for freedom and yet they have the situation where they, they can't even go play golf for four hours because right. they're going to have people, you know, and that's, that's really where you get yourself in a, in a little bit of a quagmire and you have to yes. start learning how to get yourself, especially when it's a non-virtual business too. Like if it's like a brick and mortar business and they have to physically be somewhere like yes. you're really, you, you can really get yourself in trouble, but fortunately companies like yours exist and books like clockwork yeah. exist to, to obviously solve that problem. So yeah. In the book, you know, obviously we only have a 30 minute interview, so I definitely, you know, we can't cover everything today. However, the big nugget that I got from this book, because it is a very tactical book, is the queen bee role. And that's something I remember reading that chapter. I was like, you know what? This makes a ton of sense because I'm a big 80-20 fan. So I'm yes. like, what is the 20% of things that we can do that are going to move the needle? And the queen bee role, and we'll talk about that in a minute was like a game changer for me. It's like, if we could just do this and do this all day and have other people do this, the business will keep running and being productive. Mm -hmm. So what is the queen bee role if people aren't familiar with it? And then we're going to kind of use the queen bee role in a real estate example. So our yeah. listeners context on it. So the queen bee role is when we were searching for like the most efficient organizations on the planet, we discovered that bees are actually one of the most efficient. And the idea here is that there are a lot of functions that the bees do, all of them, right? All of them have important roles. 
But the most important role that is happening within that hive in order to keep the colony in survival mode, which is the which is the point of nature, right? Like any kind of species in nature, like their whole goal is survival. So if we think of the goal as survival, what's the most important activity that is actually happening in order for the colony to survive? And what we discovered was that the activity is the queen bee rolls laying of the eggs. So the laying of the eggs is the most important thing that is happening inside of that colony. So there are other jobs that other bees are performing, but in order to be able to do those jobs, they actually have to make sure that the queen is being protected and served and has the ability to continue laying eggs before they will go and do their other what we call primary jobs or primary roles. So there yeah. are bees that like they nurse the young. There are bees that go out and get pollen. There are bees that clean out the, the hive to make sure that there's room for, you know, new uh, larvae and things like that. But they would sacrifice doing all of those jobs in order to make sure that the queen was continuing to lay her eggs. And so an example of this is I have this article, you can Google it, it's really easy to find, but like there were these bees that followed their queen for three days on the back of a car, 20,000 bees followed their queen because she was attached to this car and they, they abandoned their post, essentially they abandoned all other job functions to make sure that she was protected because they know if that role isn't being performed, if the laying of the eggs is not being performed, then nothing else that they're doing really matters, right? So understanding that it is the most important function that is happening inside of the colony. And what we wanted to kind of create the metaphor for, for businesses was that your company also has a queen bee role. There is something that is happening inside of your company that is the most important activity in order for your company to not just survive, but also to thrive and to deliver to your clients the, the most important promise that we're saying we're going to deliver to you, right? And so identification of that to your point of like the 80-20 is the ultimate efficiency tool because once you can identify like what is your most important activity as an organization, then you can start to really more easily question some of the other things that you do and maybe start yeah. to eliminate some of those other things and test and play around and say, do we really need to do this? Because if we just do this, or if we just get 10 times better at doing this, then maybe none of these other things actually matter. And so it's an exercise in resource utilization, right? Like efficiency is all about resources and making sure that we're utilizing our resources in the best possible way to get maximum results for minimal effort, right? Like efficiency is different in productivity than productivity. Like productivity is all about doing more, whereas efficiency is all about how do we use less resources to get better results, right? So you want to be thinking, what is the most important activity that our organization does to deliver on the promise that we have to our customers? Uh, and how can we eliminate other resources that are going to places that maybe don't really uh, make that big of a difference? And so the, the key here, and this is illustrated through the bees as well, is that it is the queen bee role, not the queen bee herself, because it can be easy for us as CEOs, as entrepreneurs to say like, well, I'm the queen bee, like the thing that I do is most important, but that only further entraps you into the business, right? So the, the understanding that it's about the role that the queen bee is playing, it's about the activity that she's actually performing. She's performing the laying of the eggs, like that's the action. And if the queen bee is sick or she can no longer perform that duty, the hive, the, the other bees will actually, they will off her and they will spawn a new queen in order to perform that role because they understand it's not just, a, it's not about the individual, it's about the activity that she is performing that will allow the hive to continue to survive. And the same thing, not that we want to like off you or that you have to like, you know, <laughs> that your team is going to spawn a new leader but it's really important to understand that as you kind of identify the queen bee role for your organization so that you're not automatically pinpointing yourself or feeling like that you're the only one that can do it. Like maybe you're the only one that does it now, 
but we want to really define what the activity is so that in the future we can build systems and get other people to be able to perform that activity just as easily or as effectively as you do, if that makes sense. That makes so much sense. I'm like, this is like music to my ears because oh, it's like an example. Like, let me give you an example. This is, is probably, this probably will make sense, but I'm a little bit of a novice with this. Not, not certainly don't know as much as you do. So okay, like, let's say, <laughs> let's say like, um, you're, uh, like I am a, which I'm not obviously, but I am a personal development guru, like a Tony Robbins okay. clone with blonde hair for some yes. reason. Okay. And Tony Robbins is Tony Robbins. Queen B role is, um, leading seminars to motivate people, right? As long as somebody is leading the seminars to motivate people, it doesn't have to be Tony Robbins or Greg Helbeck. It just has to be somebody motivating people at the seminars to then get them their results. Does that make sense? hundred percent. You got it. Yes. Okay. So I got it's it. Like understand, like Tony could be, or Greg could be like, yeah. Oh, it's me. I'm the, I'm yeah. the magic unicorn special yes. sauce. And that's so yeah. tempting for us to do. And for our egos, right. To be like, yeah. there's no way I could transfer this to someone else because it's all about me and like what I deliver. But if you can like more clearly articulate what it is that you're delivering for people and why it is that they're getting that results, yeah. which is challenging sometimes, but it's definitely worth the effort. Like in the Tony, Tony case of like, yeah. you know, motivating them to get a specific result. Like maybe yeah. you just have to lead seminars that motivate people to get a specific result. And Tony had, like, he is definitely, you know, the most successful under his umbrella, but he has created other leaders in his organization that are capable of doing that. So he doesn't have to be the only one delivering that. And that, that way he can create more freedom for himself. He can create more growth for his organization because he's not the only person like bottlenecking the growth as well as, um, he can create less dependence on him personally and still continue to create results for the clients that, you know, they're looking to see. That makes a lot of sense. And the biggest thing was it's the activity, not the person. Right. Yes. And that's where a lot of, and as we transition this into the real estate example, this is where a lot of my friends get, they're like, I'm the only one who can talk to sellers and negotiate. And I'm like, dude, no, you're not like, yeah, you maybe can right hire now somebody. you are, but yeah, yeah. no yeah. one can do it as good as I can. I'm like, listen, if you tr train them the right way, yes. even if they're 70% as good of you, as good as you, they're going to make 50% more offers and you're going to ultimately make more money without having to worry about being the, the bottleneck of your phone. So I'm going to, I'm going to share with you what I think the queen bee role is in a real estate business. And I want you to kind of give me your opinion on it. Cause I think I've really spent a lot of time on this, like, like thinking okay. about this, especially preparing for this interview. So I'll give you an example in the real estate investing business. For the most part, you need to generate leads, make offers on the properties that you're generating. And then some of those offers you're going to get accepted and then you're going to get a deal. And then once you have a deal, you're going to decide if you're going to flip it or rent it or wholesale it. But essentially at the end of the day, I think in, in the real estate business, the queen bee role is making offers because if you don't make the offer, nothing else matters and generating leads. I thought was it, but I feel like it's really the offer because the objective of the lead is to make the offer. So do you think that is somewhat accurate or would you say it might be something different? This is just in the acquisition department. There's a million other departments, but this yeah. is like the key here in the real estate business. So I'm going to throw you another curveball, one that's actually going to be coming out in the new book. And it's something we, we do with our clients, but the queen bee role is going to be different for different companies, even within the same niche, right? Even within the same industry, because the queen bee role stems from what we call like your big promise, which is like, what is your promise to your customers, mm. which is in some ways like your differ differentiator. It might be like something that helps you stand apart or something that you do differently. So you want to think about like, why do your customers come to you? Or why do people work with you specifically? Why do you get the referrals that you get, you know, especially in the, in the real estate industry, it might be a yeah. little bit different, right. In terms of how you think of those clients and how you think of uh, repeat business and things like that. So thinking about like, what's my, you know, promise to people, what do I do or what does our organization do better than anyone else? What's our promise to them when they do business with us, that is going to help them make a decision like between you and a competitor 
And then from there, like once we have that big promise, we can peel it back a layer and ask ourselves, how, but how do we deliver that? What's the mm. how? What is the action? What is the activity that is most important for us to deliver on that big promise, right? And so using that example or, you know, I, I often use the example of CrossFit gyms because they're mm. all CrossFit gyms, right? They're all under the same brand. <laughs> they're all yeah. technically the same industry, but each of them, each gym that I've gone to has like a little bit of a different big promise. They also, yeah. they all kind of feel a little bit different in terms of what they're offering. And so each of them might have a different queen bee role based on whatever that big promise is. So we would have to understand, you know, for, for one person or for one organization, you're absolutely right. Like if the most important thing was like volume and to like make offers, like that would be the activity or get, you're nailing it in terms of the context, like you're, you're nailing the concept. Cause a lot of times people struggle with, um, being too, too broad or too all encompassing, like making it like a catch-all for everything yeah. that they do Yeah. as well as like not understanding that it's an action. And so you're completely correct there, but someone else in the industry might say that like, maybe it's not as important for them to make as many offers as it is to have the right criteria. Maybe they make less offers, but they only make them for these specific for specific people. Problems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then that's their niche they can serve. Yeah. So and that's the thing stuff, yeah. that they need to understand. How do we select those different types of properties? And then I can, or different types of people. And then I can train someone because now I understand the queen bee role. I understand that this is what sets us apart. This is why our customers come to us. This is the most important thing for us to do to remain true to the promise that we have said we're going to deliver for our customers. So does that help that makes or confuse a lot you sense. more? No, okay. that makes a lot of sense. And it gets, I bet you a lot of the real estate entrepreneurs listening to this are like, oh my gosh. Yeah. So I want them to think sense. about like, what is their big promise, right? Like this is the homework, right? It's like, think about for your company, for your organization, what is your big promise to your customer in the real estate world? We've worked with people in the real estate and the investing world. Sometimes this can get a little bit trickier because you might have two different customers, right? And yeah, so you do. there's, yeah. it's a marketplace, right? Almost like Amazon, they have two different customers. And so you have to think about like, what is our promise to people, how we do business and why they want to do business with us. Like I said, going to past clients or people that send you a lot of referrals, people that do, you know, um, multiple deals with you are great people to kind of ask like, Hey, why do you do business with me? Like, why do you keep coming yeah. back to me? And that might give you some trends or insights if you're unsure about like what that big promise really is. And then peel it back a layer, ask yourself, what is the most important how, what is the most important activity to make sure that we're delivering on that so that if we did, you know, change the way that we do things, or if we did bring someone in, or if we did start to systematize this, what do we need to, to make sure is always protected and actually amplified as we continue to grow? Because when you start scaling, the queen bee role can actually be the, be the thing that tends to get lost because if yeah. it is the only th the thing that you only know how to do, then it is really important to identify what it is, be able to articulate it, be able to communicate it to other people on the team so that you're not losing the very thing that made you successful to begin with. I love that. I love that. It's such an actionable takeaway for the listeners because a lot of people like to try to scale but they're, like you said, they're scaling all these shiny bells and whistles and they get away from their queen bee role and then they get themselves in trouble. And then they got to go read proper first 17 times because they're in financial trouble. <laughs> yes. And they're like, you know? why isn't this working at scale? Yeah. Why can't I do what I did before? Yeah. Like we used to, you know, be able to do this and now we're unable to. And it's like going back to those, you know, those fundamentals of that queen bee role can be really helpful to uh, continue to grow and add people to the team and, and make sure that the most important thing is still the most important thing. Absolutely. I love that. And that was a great answer. I'm so like happy you answered it that way. Cause like, it just, it really could just gets the listeners to think about, they need to get really clear on what it is for them. And it, it could yes. be like the general making offers, but if they really think about it deeper, they can have a different answer for a different result. That's going to get them better outcomes. So totally like it could be for some people that like, you know, their customers, like they built, like they, they really trust them. Like they're like the most Huge trustworthy person. Right. Humongous. And so what, maybe there's an activity that they do 
with those customers that helps them build trust that no one else is doing out there or that they're doing better than anyone. And that could be their queen bee role that they want to make sure that they're not losing, especially as they translate this or transfer it to other people. Right. So even if it's not them, let's make sure we're still doing that so that that trust is still built just as an, uh, like off the top example. Yeah. That's so true too. Cause that's a big thing in our business is there's a lot of PPC, like uh, I'll buy your house as is. And you know, even me, I'm in the business. I'm like, oh, I don't know about that. So the trust factor, <laughs> you know, you're like, you see like a TV, yeah. you're like, you're going to buy my house cash. Like I remember before I got into the business, I'm like, who would ever sell the property to these knuckleheads? And now I'm one of those guys buying properties. So yeah. the trust factor, like people are already walking in skeptical. You know, it's like they're walking into church as an atheist and they're like, uh, what's going on here? And then you have to build the trust up and then make the promise. So yeah, then we could talk about this for hours, but yeah. As the, the last concept I wanted to cover, I would definitely want to respect your time is yeah. like, I remember reading the e and I'm not knocking e It's a great book for sure. But mm-hmm. the thing that book was talking about, like document systems and like write out SOPs on like a word document with like a typewriter, obviously yeah. I'm kidding about the typewriter, but I'm like, this just seems like a pain in the ass because like, if something changes, I don't want to rip up. A, I, I'm terrible at typing number one. And number two, like, I don't even own a printer. So <laughs> I re, I read clockwork and you guys were talking about capture systems on your freaking computer silly mm-hmm. and i'm like oh yeah. my god that makes so much sense so then i went like hard on dropbox made everything systematized shared it with my assistant shared it with my sales guy and like literally there's like a blueprint on buying real estate yeah. if you go into my dropbox from your uh, book clockwork so thank you for that so yeah. i just want to cover i like the like best practices for capturing systems yeah. so you can then transfer those systems to other people And if someone leaves your company, you already have those systems there as an asset for your company. Yeah. So I love that you're already doing this and went hard on it because it's such a, it's such a big asset to the organization. Like if something were to happen to you, even if it's getting sick, you know, like unpredictable, like those things are there. People can still function. Things can still get done. Your clients can still get served. And so the couple of reasons why we communicate, like why we want people to do this through the video capture format is like systems are a really big barrier and friction point for people when it comes to handing things off, hiring, stepping away from things, delegating things. They're like, oh, I don't have time to create the systems. I don't have time to do it. I don't have time to do it. And it's really like you all know in the, in the, you know, financial and real estate world that like, it's really a compound interest effect once you build the first system, right? It's like, okay, yes, might take you a little bit longer the first time, but now you never have to do it again, potentially, right? So I want you to think of every single thing that you're doing throughout your day. And if it's something that really shouldn't belong on your plate, you really want to ask yourself, like, how do I document this? How do I capture this in a way that I never have to do it again, (laughs) right? So going through with that mindset will also help you understand that you do have time to create systems. And by doing it via video, the next time that you do the activity, the, do the task, just record yourself doing it. So essentially it shouldn't take you any longer than just doing the task. So that's you're already excuse, doing it. You're already doing it, right? So the excuse is, is gone now, right? Like it's disappeared. That is no longer a barrier to us developing systems. The other point is they become obsolete really quickly. And so it's much easier to just record a video or whoever you're transferring this or delegating this over to, they are now the new owner of this system. And so if any tech updates or you know, maybe there's an improvement yeah. in the way that we do the process, like they are now responsible for recording the new video. They should not come back to you or to me and say, well, this is outdated. Like what should we, you know, should we, how should we update this? Or it's your turn to update this. Like they now own it they can be responsible for updating it. So things, you know, more easily will not become obsolete. And as you're recording, you're just going to talk through doing the activity. So you're going to, you know, tell people what steps you're doing, just talk through it, talk to the camera, it doesn't really matter. Then you can, you know, make sure that you're not skipping any steps because we are very, uh, inherently bad at remembering everything that we do when we're writing out a step-by-step SOP. So you, you know, like to your point, you're going to write out, it's going to take you forever to write this thing out. You're going to write this thing out. And then inevitably someone's going to try to do it. And they're going to realize that you missed three different steps that now they can't complete the process because they're missing and they have no visuals to be able to see. Whereas even if you're recording and you forget to mention something, 
they can see what you're doing because you're not going to be able to complete the task without clicking every single button or doing every single thing. So even if you miss like telling them about a specific step, they can watch it back. They can press pause. They can go, oh, I see that Greg forgot to mention this, but he clicked here. And now I know that that's something I need to do. You can also then like take that video and create a transcription of it if you really do want it in written format as well. It just call, like it doesn't yeah. create any more work for you. So it's a total plus side to, to things. If you're doing a lot of work on the computer, there's a ton of tools that you can use to screen record and those are like free and easily accessible. We also have a lot of clients who have brick and mortars or who find themselves, you know, they do a lot of work out in the field and you carry a camera with you all the time in your pocket. It's your phone. We've had clients who will just take it out, record themselves. We have clients in the manufacturing, the mechanical world, and they'll just record themselves doing something or troubleshooting something on a machine. And then they send it to their team members. And it's so much easier than like even trying to write out a step-by-step for yeah. something that is so visual, you know? It makes it so much easier. And I started much doing easier. this. It, I, it's especially like with our business is all virtual, basically. I mean, we have inspectors go to the property, so I don't even like show up to these things. Yeah. Uh, so like everything's on like, you know, like software, you know? So yep. like, I remember when I hired my assistant this year, I was like, all right, I'm going to just send her this Dropbox link with all this information. And she, she got a masterclass on that. And she knows that stuff better than me now. Like, I don't even know how to put this podcast podcast together anymore. <laughs> I she don't either. It. We have a podcast and I have no idea. I just record I have it no and then idea. I never see it again. Yeah, exactly. I, I'll send this to my assistant. She'll listen to this. And she's a, she's a black belt at it. And yeah. like, this is all from the systems, you know? So it's so powerful, especially too, like with virtuals, like VAs, like especially like overseas VAs. If you make a video for VAs, they will see that and they will understand that. And you can get all of this work done when you're literally sleeping because it's 12 hours away or 12 hour time zone. So it's, it's unbelievable the, the stuff you can do when you capture systems the right way. And uh, your company and your book has, has been making a serious impact in these businesses because it, it is yeah. super powerful and it's very easy to implement. So I want to definitely that. respect your time and, and wrap this interview up now. So if people wanted to learn more about you and the clockwork company, what is the best web address to direct them to if they wanted to check that out? Yes, they should go to runlikeclockwork.com. You'll be able to find, we have some free resources. We have a podcast, link to the book, link to our program, anything that you want to find, you can go to runlikeclockwork.com. We would love to connect with you. Excellent. We'll make sure that is in the show notes. And I really appreciate you coming on today. This was a blast. Yeah, I love talking you. about this stuff. It was fun. I really appreciated you doing the examples with me because a lot of times people just want the work to be done for them, yeah. but you were a great participant and I appreciate Thank you. that. <laughs> well, it's easier when I, cause I've actually read the book a few times and I'm familiar with your podcast. Yeah. So like, I'm like, all right, I, I, I know how to like take this conversation. Cause it's like, good. yeah, like I, I know how that works. Well, thank you so much. And I hope <laughs> you have a great you. rest of your day. You too. Bye. Thanks for listening to another episode of Pave the Way Podcast. We hope you got value from today's episode. Make sure you download Greg's free guide on daily personal productivity for free at www.pavetheday.com. That's pave the day spelled D-A-Y dot com. If you have any questions or want to reach out, head over to www.pavethewaypodcast.com. We'll see you on the next episode.